Hey guys, what's up? Now, this is going to be my favorite movies of 2017 video. And it's going to be a top 5 list as opposed to a top 3 or top 10 list. Because, honestly, I didn't really get the chance to see too many movies this year. Because I was so busy with school and other things. But, yeah, this is going to be my top 5 favorite movies of 2017. And if you disagree with my list, again, that's fine. Whatever. Everybody's list is going to be different, obviously. In case you're wondering why I didn't get a chance to do my um, spoiler review for Star Wars, it's because, like, my friends weren't available to help me um, do it, and um, I just didn't have the time to do it. So yeah, this is going to be my final video of the year. Yeah, so let's get started. Okay, so starting the list off at number five is Spider-Man Homecoming. Now, I was really looking forward to this movie for a few reasons. Firstly, the last two with um, Andrew Garfield, you know, didn't really impress me all that much. But also because uh, this was going to be Spider-Man's first movie in the official Marvel Cinematic Universe. And the fact that it takes place right after Captain America Civil War. And Tom Holland's Spider-Man was easily one of the best parts of Captain America Civil War. So yeah, those were really the main reasons why I was looking forward to it. But also because um, it really looked like it was kind of doing its own thing. You know, it, it didn't f look like it was going to be like the others. And it turns out that's exactly what it was. It felt very different than the other Spider-Man movies we've gotten. Like, it, it didn't try too much like to repeat the traditions of like the the originals. It's really a high school comedy. It really is kind of a love letter and a tribute to um, 80's uh, high school comedies like um, Breakfast Club and you can kind of see that in its um, writing and just overall tone. Tom Holland was great as Spider-Man. He's funny. He was uh, great in the emotional parts, he was great in the action and stunts, which is interesting because he has a background in gymnastics. I mean, he was in uh, the musical Billy Elliot. And also the comedy was easily one of the best parts of this movie. Even though I, I rewatched it like recently and there are times when the comedy kind of goes overboard and there's a little too much of it, which is um, kind of the same problem I had with Thor Ragnarok. Like there's a little too much comedy. It's so funny because people are complaining that <laughs> Star Wars Episode Eight had too much comedy, but no, no, no. I, I think Thor Ragnarok and Spider-Man Homecoming kind of had too much, but hey, that's just my opinion. By the way, no, as a whole, Spider-Man Homecoming, it was really fun. It was different. It didn't feel like the others. It kind of felt like its own thing. It was a great welcome back to the Marvel official universe for Spider-Man, and um, it had great comedy, great action. Um, and also a great villain in Michael Keaton's The Vulture. My god, he's easily one of the best Spider-Man villains probably since Doc Ock as played by Alfred Molina in Spider-Man 2. In fact, I think this is the best Spider-Man movie since Spider-Man 2. Okay, coming in the list at number 4 is another superhero movie that's also a comedy, and that is the Lego Batman movie. I think I honestly laughed more in this movie than any movie I saw this year. And I didn't see many movies this year, but that, what I loved so much about this one is it basically pokes fun at the entire history of Batman. And Batman is my all-time favorite superhero just because he's so, like, relatable and realistic. And ironically enough, I'm wearing a Batman shirt, <laughs> which I didn't plan for this video, by the way. But, um... No, I, I I loved that aspect of this movie, but also kind of like some of the main themes of, of this movie. And, and you think for a comedy, it wouldn't have deep themes, but it kind of does. What's great about um, Batman in this movie is that like um, once all all the criminals are like put into Arkham Asylum, and like um, uh, Commissioner Gordon's daughter Barbara, aka Batgirl, kind of like um, takes over the Gotham Police Force, like Batman kind of feels like he has nothing to do, he has no purpose left in a way. There's another um, emotional aspect of the movie and that's really um, Bruce trying to, you know, find, you know, a family, you know, you know trying to um, really just 
um, live with um, being alone. Even though, even though that aspect of his character is kind of played for laughs in this, but um, but, but when he meets um, Robin, aka Dick Grayson, played by Michael Sarah, who was pretty good in this, um, he kind of starts to realize that you know um, maybe being alone is um, not the best. And um, yeah, so this movie, it, it works as a comedy, it works as a little bit of a drama, um, but also it, it just really works as you know, a Batman movie as well. Coming in the list at number three is Star Wars Episode Eight: The Last Jedi. Now, I'm not gonna go into like the massive amount of criticisms that have been like surrounding this movie over the last few weeks, because I, okay, in, in my opinion, after seeing it a second time like a week ago, I liked it even more. And my official grade, by the way, is a solid A, and it is my fourth favorite Star Wars movie now. My fourth favorite. Number three is Return of the Jedi. Number two is Star Wars, aka New Hope, and then number one uh, is Empire Strikes Back. I liked it better than Force Awakens because it took more risks. It felt like its own standalone thing. Um, it was definitely better than Rogue One. It had way better pacing and editing. Even though, yeah, that second act with Finn and Rose does kind of drag the pacing, and it's not necessarily as interesting as the other storylines, especially with Ray and Luke. I, I seriously wish. Like, that the entire first act of the movie should have been all Ray and Luke. Like, there should have been, like, two or three extra scenes with um, Ray and Luke training on the island. But anyway, no, I think as a sequel, this movie did what it should have done. It um, went, in, went in a different direction than the first movie did. It expanded on the world and characters that were created in the first movie. And it basically threw any and all expectations we had out the window, which I think is people's biggest complaint and the biggest reason why a lot of people didn't like it is because like their expectations weren't met well you know that's gonna happen I mean you can't you can't always win I mean and I think that aspect of it is what makes it good it, it, it basically challenges what we thought we knew about the last movie in a kind of clever way and like at the same time it kind of challenges and makes us, the fans, kind of question, like, everything we thought we knew about the other movies and about the universe. But yeah, that my highest compliment I can give this movie is the risks it took and the fact that it went in a totally different direction than I thought it would. I'm looking forward to episode 9, obviously, but I am curious as to how JJ is going to tie this whole thing together. I mean, I am kind of worried, considering, um... The writer of Batman vs. Superman is co-writing Episode 9, Chris Terrio. That kind of worries me, but also the fact that, like, when it comes to trilogies, the third movie tends to be the worst. Not always. I mean, with the original trilogy, it was the exception. I, I, I think Return of the Jedi is good. Yes, it's the weakest of the original trilogy, I know, but I still have a lot of nostalgia and think it's... It, it, it. I think the reason why I think Return of the Jedi is better than this is because it was the culmination of everything that the first two movies built up to. And this, and, and Last Jedi kind of does the same thing, but at the same time leaves it, it open for more possibilities. And I'm excited for Ryan Johnson's um, spin-off trilogy. Coming in the list at number two is Baby Driver. One of the most fun, intense, and also unique thriller and heist movies I've ever seen. <laughs> the soundtrack, the soundtrack is easily the best part of it because like the soundtrack actually plays a role in the story, um, especially with Ansel Elgort's character baby. Um, like how like he, he listens to certain tracks just to kind of like get him in the mood and also because like music kind of plays a significant role in his backstory. But no, this was a very stylish um, heist movie. And I say stylish because of the way the soundtrack is used, because of the way the action is filmed. Oh my god. Th this is some of the best action scenes I've seen in a movie this year so far. Especially the car chases, which are so intense because they're done for real. Same thing with a lot of the uh, physical stunts as well. And also the acting is 
pretty much great um, all around, especially from uh, Jamie Foxx and Kevin Spacey. Now, my number one favorite movie of 2017 is Dunkirk. I um, rewatched this literally yesterday, and I am still blown away. I got it for Christmas on Blu-ray, and watching those IMAX scenes again, holy crap. And also, watching the special features on how they freaking recreated this historical event, pretty much 98% for real. Literally, there's barely any CGI in this movie, and that's why it works so well, is because it makes you feel like you're there and in the moment. It feels like th th this is really happening, and that it is... Um, as historically accurate as possible, even though I don't know the details of the actual Dunkirk evacuation, because, you know, it's not a story that we Americans grew up with, um, British people did, but anyway, um, no, what I've loved about this movie is just the overall intense thriller int feel, y you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's basically a thriller, it, it's not like a traditional war movie, it, it, it's not like Saving Private Ryan, which is more of a drama, and really focuses more on the physical horrors of war. This kind of focuses more on the psychological and mental horrors. And that's why it works so well. Is because, like, it, it really is all about the psychological and internal terror these guys feel. Because they know they can be taken out literally at any minute. And you feel for them. You want them to survive, even though you don't get to know any of them. Um, which is another thing. While Saving Private Ryan kind of focuses more on the characters and their relationships, this kind of focuses more on the thriller, um, you know, heart-pounding, intense nature of war. And that's why I kind of think this is a little bit more realistic than uh, Saving Private Ryan is because, like, it, it's always, it's an in-the-moment kind of a movie, you know, like, you feel like you are one of these soldiers trapped on this beach, like, you never know what's going to happen next. That sense of uncertainty is what really adds to the tension and horror, almost, of this movie. The movie, in and of itself, is a race against time, essentially, and that's how Christopher Nolan described it, you know, like, and that's, I think, one of the reasons why it's his shortest movie, is because, like, in order for that intensity to stick with the audience, you know, you can't drag the movie on like it has to be tight and contained, and that's what I think adds to the intensity of it. The acting all around is great. The soundtrack fits the intensity. Hans Zimmer's score, of course, is amazing, um, especially with the you know re repeating ticking clock. It, it kind of reminded me of um, the Joker's theme from Dark Knight. In other words, it's just one note that keeps going on and on and on and on and doesn't stop and builds and builds and builds. It starts out quiet and then gets more louder and intense as the movie goes on. And also how the movie cuts back between three different storylines, the guys on the on the beach, um, the guys in the planes um, in the air defending the beach, and then the families and civilians crossing the channel to help evacuate the troops. It's It all blends really well and overall feels like a very satisfying victory at the end. So yeah, that was my uh, favorite movies of 2017. One crazy, crazy year. <laughs> um, hopefully uh, 2018 will bring us some good movies and um, yeah, uh, see you guys in 2018. Bye. <laughs>